Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Channel Justice. I am the director of the Temerte Contemporary Ukraine program at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And my book is entitled Without the State, Self-Organization and Political Activism in Ukraine. And it's being released this year with the University of Toronto Press. The book is the product of my dissertation research, which took place in 2013 and 2014. Um, but really, you know, the book is, is, has come a long way from the dissertation, as, as often happens. Um, so I really wanted to use the book to make sure that people who are interested in Ukraine and Ukrainian politics understand the significance of, of the Euromaidan protests, not just as an important thing that happened in 2013 and 2014, but as a much more substantially influential moment in terms of all of Ukraine's political culture. Um, so, you know, how people participate in politics, how people see themselves as citizens of Ukraine, all of these things are kind of included in, in, in the book. Um, and obviously these are themes that resonate um, up until this day. The, the quote actually is directly from an interview with an activist who was talking about, she told me this story about right after the Russian soldiers invaded Crimea, she went with a, a friend to do this photo project to take pictures of people um, in Crimea. And the, the, the person that she was with, you know, they, they were talking to these Crimean women and these women said, girls, this is a great idea, but you know what? We don't actually want to do this photo project right now. We need to get out of Crimea. And so the person who I was doing the interview with, um, she and, and her friend who went to do this photo project, they just helped this group of women and their families get off the territory of Crimea into the territory of Ukraine. And as she told me in this interview, we did it all without any help from the state. And I just thought that encompassed this idea that in, in terms of, of international law, right, the Ukrainian state in 2014 was responsible for every single citizen that lived on the territory of Ukraine. In terms of displacement, the Ukrainian state is responsible for people who are displaced within Ukraine. You know, they have some obligation to meet people's basic needs. Um, and that's not what was happening. But what people found through the experience of Euromaidan was that if they did everything themselves, they could often do things like this, this evacuation of women from Crimea. It was actually easier without state intervention because they could just do, you know, they could mobilize people on the internet with cell phones, right? They created their own networks. Um, and, and so it turned out that doing things yourself, self-organization was sometimes more effective. And, and that's really the lesson of without the state. A lot of people were doing things that would count as self-organization that they would not define as political or as activism. But if you look at it through another lens, it very clearly seems political because self-organization was filling the gaps left by the state, right? So when people are being evacuated from Crimea, people are coming to Lviv, right? There's no government there who's responsible for resettling people, although technically the government is responsible for resettling people. It's just volunteers working on a hotline, looking for people who can serve as hosts, looking for people who can help find jobs. Um, these are people who told me about their, their work with these hotlines that did not think of themselves as doing something political. Um, they just felt it was the right thing to do. So I, I don't know if it was, I think part of the the difference is that many people, things that I would consider self-organization and that I call part of the umbrella of self-organization in the book, it's a very big umbrella. So working on a hotline also counts as self-organization, but so does mass protests, right? So does um, you know organizing um, organizing a, a, a large scale political demonstration. And and I think that's the power of the concept, right? Is that it it has that breadth. Um, and it has that great applicability. So I actually started in 2013. I got to Ukraine in September of 2013. And my plan was to do research with activists who were working on higher education. So university-based student activists. Um, and I was interested in looking at higher education reform. There was a very robust student union, an independent student union that had been organizing um, across Ukraine over the past um, five or so years before that. And so my idea was already to work with activists. And then when the protests that became Euromaidan started, I just sort of followed them there because they all wanted to go, they all wanted to participate. 
they all felt like they had something to contribute. So I was really lucky in that I had a group of people that I already knew well to kind of use as an entry point into these protests, which of course, I mean, most people listening and, and watching, I'm sure know that they got very violent. Um, they got very dangerous. So I, I got really lucky because every day I could check in with activists who had a much better sense of what was going on than, than I did. Um, so they would say things, you know, they would call me sometimes and say, I think you really should come and watch this thing that's happening. Or, you know, <laughs> my favorite was the day when they called, I get this call, I'm, I'm on Khrushchev, you know, walking down, looking at the piles of cobblestones and I get this phone call hey, Emily, we just occupied the Ministry of Education. You should probably come. You're, you're going to want to write about this. So I had people kind of taking care of me in that way. But there were also times where it got dangerous and they said, I think you should go home. Um, you know, they made sure that I didn't get into a situation where they would be responsible for making sure that I was safe. So I just kind of, you know, trusted these people. The, I was working with this group since 2012. So I knew them, you know, pretty well even before the protests began. And, and you know, standing outside in, in the freezing cold protesting with hundreds of thousands of other people, it gets you pretty close to people pretty quick. You, your trust really, you know, it builds. Um, so I was sort of, it was a little, um, it, it worked out that I was already working with activists because it allowed me to sort of see this big protest movement through a specific activist oriented lens. Um, and I think that made the ethnographic research easier Although I will also add it, it you know, it, it was limiting because it meant that I, I didn't necessarily have a broad access. So I only really worked with this, this sort of student group, feminist groups, leftist oriented groups. I didn't really work with people from the far right. You know, I don't have a, 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 a big picture, right? Like there's a lot of great survey research that shows what the demographic of those protests were. That's not what I was doing. And, and I think both of those things are important. Um, but I, I think, you know, I had to make choices kind of on the fly as it was happening. Do I want to try to do research with the far right? Actually, you know, that seems a little bit risky. I'm going to stick with the people that I know. You know, um, those decisions, you know, I made them in, in the heat of the moment. And I, I think I think they were still the right decision. But it, these are questions of research that we're never really prepared for. So I interviewed um, around 30 activists for the book in some way or another at, at some point or another. Um, the group that I was working with is, is pretty small, um, as, as you might guess, you know, higher education activists, feminist activists. Um, but of course, you know, that um, I worked with that group since, since 2012. So in addition to doing interviews, I also went to, for example, planning meetings when there was a big demonstration and they all got together to decide how to participate, I would go to those meetings. Um, you know, oftentimes we would go to the protests together and then afterward we would all go to a cafe and talk about what happened. So I have a lot of data that, that kind of combines the interviews where we talk about the experience and the motivation and the kind of political perspective that person is coming from. That gets followed up with, you know, placing that person within this bigger picture of what was happening. Um, and then, you know, you, you mentioned social media. I also looked at people's social media accounts a lot as well, because there was a lot of circulation of people's opinions on what was going on. Um, and, and that's an interesting thing to kind of add to the mix is what people say about what's happening to them online. That's, that's very interesting. I, I think there's, there's two parts to this answer. The first one is exactly the illustration of self-organization, which really the key idea is if you have the ability to do something and that thing needs to be done, then you step up and do it. So the, the motivation for these activists in particular of self-organization is that they have the skills to do whatever needs to be done. Um, and so in that sense, their whole motivation is about what they can already do. Um, and that that's something that I think resonates much more broadly than just that just Euromaidan. And, and in this exact example in particular, these are student activists who had been organizing mass demonstrations throughout the later 2000s. Um, so they had that experience. So that's what they did. Right. That was the thing that they could do. Um, th and that changed over the course of the protest. People did different things. People did legal aid. They started hotlines. Right. They did all sorts of different things. Um, but they started out where they were most equipped. Um, and the second answer is, is or second part of the answer is that bec because of the way these activists saw their own social organization, which was very non-hierarchical, and they insisted on this 
all the time in interviews when I would ask them about it, even though in reality, non, non hierarchical relationships aren't always exactly, you know, ideal. Um, but a lot of what they did in terms of action focused on skill sharing. And so by that, I mean, if someone had a skill, they were often thinking about how to transfer that skill so that other people could also have it. Um, and this was really important and it, and it does reinforce the non-hierarchical kind of aspect. It's important not to just have one person who can serve as you know, the hotline coordinator and everybody else is subordinated to that person. That's not the most effective way to do things. Whereas if we all, and I'm just using the hotline as one example, there's, there's plenty more. Um, but if we all kind of have the same understanding of what this thing is, we all have the same training, we can all contribute to it equally um, or as much as we are capable of, and then it's more effective in the long run. So I think that answer is, is, is twofold and that kind of non-hierarchical making sure everybody has access to the same set of skills is a really important part of it. The, the best example is the occupation of the Ministry of Education. Um, and I say that because this is the occupation of a major higher educational institution was something that got tossed around as early as December of 2013. The student activists, they, they kind of knew that they had this critical mass of students who really wanted to, they were the, the motor of the protest. They were willing to do, you know, pretty radical stuff to make sure that the protest continued. Um, and so the, the activists that I worked with were talking about occupying one of the buildings at Tarashchenko National University. And this got canceled at the last minute because of some miscommunication, some misunderstanding. But that idea continued throughout the protests. And as I mentioned, in February, they actually occupied the Ministry of Education, which is frankly quite much more radical than a university building, in, in my opinion. Um, and the way that they told me the story was was honestly that they just kind of walked in because nobody was there. And the the ease which, with which they became the voice of higher education, the way that that position allowed them to make demands, you know, I think that was far beyond what they expected. And because they had been so active in the sphere of higher education before, they were prepared to make pretty dramatic demands in terms of, you know, open accounting and, and making sure that the minister would be held accountable to students. Um, I mean, there's certainly questions about in the long run how effective that was, how, how much that worked. That's sort of, I think, a different question. But really, how they very, you know, they took the success of this occupation and they turned it into, okay, we're going to use our, our position to make demands and we aren't leaving until we achieve them. Um, and it was because they mobilized thousands of students who, again, did not consider themselves activists necessarily and who are willing, you know, to, to do that kind of more radical move to make sure they got what they wanted. And, and that was just, it was, it was really remarkable to witness. So I did follow up research in 2017 and then again in, in, in 2020 briefly and, and or sorry, 2019 and 2021. Um, and a lot of people really assessed a great disappointment in post Maidan Ukraine, whether it was because they hoped that institutions would be more transparent because of the reforms that they were promoting. And those institutions were not in fact more transparent. Sometimes it was because someone they championed to enter into the government shifted their position dramatically once they entered into that government. Some of it was, okay, the figureheads of a lot of these ministries changed, but the people who actually do the work did not change, right? There are all these, kind of more day-to-day -day ways that there was not actually a lot of transition after Euromaidan, and that's what most people, I think, are most critical of. And there's a couple of examples of left, leftist activists who entered or attempted to enter into, into the kind of representative political sphere and have had almost no success. I mean, they, you know, they are bringing, they, they're championing workers' rights, they're, they're certainly bringing a new discourse to light, um, but they haven't gotten elected. So that in terms of entering into representative politics, it's something that a lot of them have talked about, but hasn't been especially successful. Um, so when Zelensky ran for president in 2019, it was a really interesting situation because 
they felt very, um, they had become extremely critical of, of Poroshenko during his administration, in part because of Poroshenko's alliances with far right figures and far right groups in terms of the, um, especially in terms of, of, of military reform and, and internal ministry reform. Um, they really felt strongly that Poroshenko was kind of, um, how should I put it? basically making political pluralism not possible in Ukraine. And so they sort of, a lot of them really felt like Zelensky was the one because he didn't say a lot of his policy platform was not especially substantial in, in 2019, but because he represented something else, leftists were more inclined to vote for him in 2019 because they felt like that wasn't precluding the possibility of political pluralism. I guess I would say that there keeps being this recurring sort of, okay, let's try again with the representative politics. You know, there's not a total, necessarily a total cutting off of willingness to participate, but there's kind of a constant frustration or disappointment with electoral and representative politics and institution building because, you know, idealistic efforts to, to build transparency and to make the country more representative, you know, it, it can be disappointing um, when things sort of go in a direction that you, um, you you wish they wouldn't, I guess. I think the key thing is that, he, you know, Zelensky represents a possibility that Poroshenko and many people like Poroshenko, they represent no possibility, right? It's not that Zelensky promises any achievement, but the possibility is always there. The, the room for negotiation is always there. And that is really important I think when you're an activist, and especially when you're arguing from a typically very marginalized position, just having the space to make your point and, and having, you know, some outlet to make claims on, that's essential. Um, so I, I think, you know, I don't, I don't think that Zelensky is some, you know, savior of political pluralism in Ukraine, but the opportunity that he allows for is absolutely important and it's absolutely different than previous administrations. So in that sense, I think, um, you know, it, it's really, certainly he's done, I think lots of, obviously now I'm, you know, I think he's done great at leading Ukraine through this awful, awful war. Um, but in terms of actual political representation, you know, he definitely, made, um, created openings, I think, that maybe uh, keep people going in ways that that's really necessary. I, you know, obviously there are certain, there's always people in a group that are louder or more vocal or, or more aggressive than others. I think um, the key trait I would actually say that, that I found in, in most of the activists I talked to is curiosity, you know, the willingness to ask questions instead of accept what they saw in front of them. And that, that can lead in so many different directions. And, you know, to be clear, like that leads to conflict as well. Not everybody agrees on, on what should happen next and how it should be accomplished. Um, but I think it's essential for me to say these, the, the people who participated in my research directed the research as, as much as, you know, my ideas of what I wanted to do. I would talk to them and their curiosity is what led me in, in specific directions and conversations that I had with them about how to think about politics in Ukraine is what led my research. So in that sense, I think um, I, I have to give them so much credit for exactly that trait that I think inclines them toward activism and inclines them toward this idea that we can change the world if we, you know, if we want to put the time and effort into it. You know, I so I, I come from the uh, background in anthropology and in anthropology of this part of the world, we really often think about it as post-socialist. That's the main idea that we talk about this region with. And we've been fighting with that term for a long time. We always talk about whether it's still valid on and on and on for years. When I started my research in Ukraine with, you know, started it in earnest in, in 2012, and I tried to talk to some of the people I was going to work with about that framework, they were very quick to say, we don't really think about ourselves in that way. We think about Ukraine as a kind of post-colonial place. Um, and we, we really think that that's more accurate. And that was a hugely influential moment for me because I, I mean, it happened very early on and I came into this research with this very 
strong idea of how I thought I understood things and getting that reality check pretty quickly um, was really helpful. And it really, you know, that's something I've taken with me all the way up until now. I think that post-colonial framework is more important than ever. Um, and, and there's a lot of examples of, of my research participants really kind of checking what I was doing and saying like, I don't know if those are, you know, that's really the way to think about this. Um, when I first started doing interviews and I was asking questions about how people interacted with each other and how their organizations work together people just told me these these questions are stupid you can't ask them i mean they were they were not very <laughs> polite about it um but it was kind of important to have those moments because i think ultimately it made me rethink you know it made me rethink the research from within so i was already you know it was already in progress um but it was you know i had the choice of either just pursuing what I had established versus allowing, you know, letting go a little bit and allowing the situation to direct my research. Um, that's, I think, it's more interesting for me. I, I don't know if everybody would choose that route, um, but that's that's what I that's what I did. So I was always interested in in feminism and gender politics in Ukraine, and when I got to um, when I started the research, I was hoping to kind of have a, a, a gender angle on student activism. Um, but obviously, you know, the protests started. And so I was, I was really lucky to get to observe how feminist activists in Ukraine wanted to participate in the protests. I, I mean, there's, there's this really, I mean, for really for, for centuries, we see this documented in Marta Bohashevsky Komiak's book, Feminists Despite Themselves, which is about, you know, from the 1880s is when it begins. Um, there's always been this tension between what we can call feminism and nationalism, um, where if women are participants in the nation building project, which they are, um, how does gender equality fit into that nation building? And there's often been this tension where in Ukraine, the attitude has, has, has been, okay, let's get the nation established first, and then we'll deal with the gender equality question. And so feminists on Maidan are saying, actually, we don't wanna wait. We see this as part of the European future that these protests are asking for. Let's talk about it now. Um, they were not always welcomed. Um, there, there was a lot of violence in response to this. At the same time, there was a lot of support for this. I mean, every time feminists did a, a kind of feminist protest or brought feminist signs, you know, one person would get attacked, but somebody else would come and say, actually, I'm really glad you're doing this. I want to be more involved. Or, I have these great photos of this this older gentleman who got into this conversation with a couple of feminist activists and decided he really supported what they were saying and he wanted to take pictures with the don't be afraid of feminism sign. You know, you, you just never knew it was gonna happen. And that tension, um, obviously things, you know, gender politics in Ukraine since 2014 are, are really fascinating. And I think that the, the inclusion of feminist activism on Maidan is a huge part of that. Um, you know, women becoming, having access to combat roles in the military, protections as veterans, um, you know, more women than ever in the Ukrainian parliament as representatives, as high level figures. I think these are the representative examples of some of the things that women on Maidan were fighting for. And that's, that's just been, um, you know, I, I think it's a really important part of the, that exactly that tension between feminism and nationalism. One of the things I talk about a lot in the book is that the, the people that I worked with in particular coming from this leftist perspective, they had to decide if they wanted to stick to the most radical version, the most orthodox version of their political demands, which was not going to result in people listening to them. They, there's a lot of you know negative attitude toward leftist ideas. There's a lot of associations with socialism and communism. And so most people found that by strategically dialing it back, and by that I mean that the things that they decided to do, for example, were to not name the organizations that they were a part of, right? So not have a kind of you know organizational, this is the people from X group, Right, we're going to this protest as individuals. We want to go together because it's safer, but we want to make sure our voices are heard. So they would talk about how to write a sign that they could take that wasn't going to produce a negative response, but that would resonate with the people. So I have this great story um, about there's a they did a they created this massive banner that said um, "No to the police state." 
And this banner made the rounds. It was all over the city center and it ended up in the occupied city hall. And I don't think that anybody in that occupied city hall knew that radical leftist activists made that banner. But the whole idea, the police state was, you know, they were the ones who were perpetrating the violence. Everybody in that city hall had experienced that police state. They understood what it meant. And that rhetoric, that symbolism of that language was so much more important than saying X organization did this or, you know, and, and because these activists knew that the protests were such an important moment, they felt that it was more important that they were there and that they participated at all over the idea that they had to represent some very specific point of view. Now, I say all of that, not everybody agrees. There are plenty of leftists who have spoken out about, you know, the Maidan not representing them and, and, and therefore they didn't participate in that sort of thing. Um, so that exists as well. But but my my experience was that more people were more willing to, you know, it was more important that they were there. Um, and, and, you know, they were also kind of at an advantage because they had a lot of experience with street demonstrations. You know, they'd had interactions with police officers in the past and that sort of thing. So in terms of like the physical space and the physical action, I think they were pretty prepared. But in terms of, of those bigger picture kind of rhetorical where they see themselves in the protests, they had to be flexible. And it, it ser I think it served them well. Um, I think maybe there's a lot of, you know, some people probably agree, some people probably don't, but, but I think it served them well. And honestly, you know, I have done a lot of interviews with people who were doing exactly these types of things in 2014 after the invasion of Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk regions. It was the same style of self-organization that responded to a lot of the displacement of people from all of those regions that allowed, and, and that was, they, that's deeply connected to Euromaidan because remember, this is right after the protests. And so everybody is thinking about self-organization. Everybody is really, mm, politically, it's, it's still rather chaotic. And yet we've got these massive numbers of displaced people we know we can do anything, right? We just over three out of COVID. So let's transfer that into doing something productive. And so we see a lot of those shifts at a, a large scale for, for that time. But those are the skills that I think really prepared people for, for 2022. Um, again, I, I, the whole thing is that we have this experience. We know we can do it. So we're going to do it again. Um, and, you know, people also really understand that sort of trust-based networks are the most effective way to get a thing from point A to point B. Um, and, and that, again, was something that I think was built during Euromaidan. You know, people participated because they knew somebody else who participated, right? It was a very much a, a kind of snowball effect. Um, so the, the same principles that motivated people then definitely motivate people now, and the same experience motivates people now. I think the, the main message is that Ukraine is a diverse place. And I, I mean that both in terms of, you know, ethnicity and language, but also in terms of politics and identity. Um, Ukraine is not any one thing. Euromaidan was not any one thing. Lots of different people from lots of different places with a multitude of different political backgrounds participated in those events, still live in Ukraine now, and essentially support Ukraine's war effort now. Um, these are, you know, these activists that I worked with who have historically been political activists because they have a problem with the state or the government, they're on the front lines right now. They are getting humanitarian aid to people in the occupied territories or in places that have seen violence. Um, you know, these are people who are now giving their lives for Ukraine as well. And I think it's just really important that we understand that Ukraine is this really multivocal and diverse place. And yet this war is bringing all these people together to fight for the same thing, which is the continued existence of Ukraine. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still quite close with a lot of the people who make the core of, of the book. So on the one hand, I don't preclude doing further research on activism, but on the other, they've, they've given me so much of their lives and I, I wanna stop asking them for help. Um, so I've been working on a project about displacement and I started this research in 2019 and I was looking at the um, internal, so internal displacement, particularly from Donbass, but I was looking at this kind of connection with self-organization and the Ukrainian government's lack of, of unified policy around displacement up until then. Um, obviously this research is, is a little bit derailed right now, um, 
but at the same time, I think it's still really important that we understand those eight years between Euromaidan and this current war. Um, I think I, I think there's a lot to learn from that time period. So I'm focusing on, I have a, a large trove of interviews with displaced people that another anthropologist did during that time period, so 2014 to 2016. Um, and I'm, I'm using those interviews to kind of think about the lessons that we learned from, from that part of the war that's gonna help us better understand, first of all, the problem of displacement, but in terms of a bigger picture, you know, how we how we rebuild Ukraine in the future after the victory. Thank you, thank you. I love your Knistovsky in the background, by the way. I I just, I was looking at the the one on the my right, the red one. <laughs> Thanks. You too, you too, take care. Bye. Do